Welcome to this Citizen Arts podcast, Liberty versus Tyranny, the Czech experience. Hi, I'm Jim Gay. No place in Europe has been more at the center of the confrontation between Western liberal democracy and Russian totalitarianism than what we now know as the Czech Republic. And today, certainly, with nearby neighbor Ukraine in a deadly war with Russia, fighting to keep its sovereignty as a free nation, this confrontation is front and center in the minds of the Czech people. And so in this two episode Citizen Arts podcast, we seek to provide insights about the Central and Eastern European situation vis-a-vis -vis Russia and attitudes about NATO. To do this, we are most fortunate to be able to present a discussion among four very knowledgeable, thoughtful Czechs. Jan Kavan, Pavel Babashek, Eva Klabalova, and Jan Zelezny. Jan Kavan was a student leader in the 1960s, emigrated to the UK in 1969, and from there supplied the Czech opposition with literature and duplicators for 20 years. He returned to Czechoslovakia in 1989 and was elected a member of parliament and later elected senator in the Czech Republic. He has served as Foreign Minister and Deputy Prime Minister of the Czech Republic. In 2002-03, he was the elected President of the United Nations General Assembly. Today, he is Deputy Chairman of Social Democratic Seniors and Spokesperson for the Association of Labor and Solidarity. Pavel Hlavashek is a professor at the Metropolitan University in Prague. He received his PhD at the University of West Bohemia and MA from Palaki University, both in the Czech Republic. He has also studied in Great Britain, the US and Spain. Pavel focuses on politics in the Czech Republic and does extensive research on US foreign policy and security issues in East Asia, where he is visiting professor at Hanoi University of Vietnam and the University of Mongolia. Eva is a freelance designer, product developer and lecturer who combines design and technology to create sustainable footwear. She's the founder and creative director of Cobb Footwear, which creates vegan sneakers produced in limited editions from waste and leftover materials. And let me tell you folks, you gotta go up online and look at these shoes. They are amazing, highly creative, and very, very eco-friendly. Ava works with teams in the Czech Republic Italy, Portugal, and China. She is dedicated to restoring the footwear industry to its former prominence in the Czech Republic. Jan is a PhD student of international relations at the University of West Bohemia. He focuses on the formation of and change in the international order with an emphasis on the US-China rivalry, US foreign policy in Asia, and global political economics. He regularly participates in political science conferences around Europe. Thinking about the Czech Republic and democracy, I think people who have at least some knowledge of the Czech Republic would assume it all started in 1989, but it didn't. The Czech history with democracy goes back quite a ways. Is that correct, Pavel? The roots uh, of uh, Czech uh, or Czechoslovak democracy were basically built upon the heritage of uh, Habsburg uh, monarchy. How did the roots of democracy come out of a monarchy? Please go ahead, Jan Zelensky. Well, you have to understand that the Habsburg monarchy was uh, a constitutional monarchy, so it, it was quite similar to the state of the British monarchy. Uh, for example, there was uh, the elected elected parliament and uh, the Czech people had uh, their representative also in the government uh, during the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. So if we take it into the 20th century, what was the system after World War I in the area that became Czechoslovakia? The roots of uh, democracy was, uh, let's say, relatively, generally speaking, it was uh, relatively well established after the First uh, uh, World War. At least if you compare uh, at that time Czechoslovakia with other countries uh, in uh, Central uh, Europe. However, Czechoslovakia in the period between the world uh, wars 
was uh, far uh, from uh, far from perfect. I think the original idea of uh, Czechoslovakia was that uh, we would be a sort of uh, Switzerland of uh, uh, Central Europe, uh, where people of uh, different uh, origins, uh, ethnic uh, religions uh, would, uh, let's say, peacefully uh, live together. And somehow after the Great Depression uh, and especially when uh, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis came to power, that idea of Switzerland, of uh, Central Europe, started to erode. Thank you, Pavel. Jan Kavan? I agree with uh, what my colleague said. Uh, um, however, I would still maintain that this imperfect democracy which we had was still a parliamentary democracy significantly more democratic than in some, some of our neighboring countries, in particular uh, Poland and, uh, and Hungary. So in that sense, it was not a perfect democracy, but within Central Europe, it was still one of the most democratic countries. Thank you, uh, Jan. Then came the invasion, the takeover by the, by the Germans. What happened during uh, the German occupation that changed the direction, the outlook of the Czech people? What was the most significant aspect of that heading toward the arrival of, this, of the Russians? I would say uh, that uh, most people had to uh, ask um, um, where do we belong to? The period of the Second World War, that was perhaps the most difficult times in our uh, modern history. Many people died. Uh, properties was confiscated um, by Germans. From the point of view of political science, I would say many people, especially um, political elite, had to ask uh, where do we belong to and what can we do in order uh, not to repeat the same development that happened in those 20 years after the First World War that ended in another World War. And I think mm, too many people were, I would say, blind uh, in sense that they uh, believed that we should look for security from the Soviet uh, Union because that brought us uh, from one uh, tyranny of uh, Nazi Germany to a tyranny, a communist tyranny. The arrival of the Russians was welcomed as a relief from the sort of tyranny of the Nazis. Absolutely, absolutely. There, there were some, I believe, nine uh, tenths uh, of uh, Czechoslovak territory was liberated by the Red Army. And, and, and I, well, let, me, let, me add, uh, let me add one more point. Once uh, your country is liberated by the Red Army, the Red Army never uh, pulls back. Yes, the Russians came in 45 and they were welcomed because they were perceived as liberators from the Nazis. But in fact, they didn't stay. They in fact pulled back. Um, by 1946, there were no Soviet troops. There were Soviet advisors um, in various ministries. But Soviet troops went back to the Soviet Union um, and they stayed there until 1968 um, when they invaded the country. That's a good segue to, to what we would call the period of Soviet influence. If the Soviets were not directly on the ground in Czechoslovakia, what was the nature of governance in Czechoslovakia in that post-war period? Well, if I may. Yes, please. Go ahead, Jan. Zelezny. After the Second World War, there was the idea of Czechoslovakia being, let's say, a bridge between the Western Europe, between the United States and the Soviet Union. It did not work because uh, the influence uh, of the Soviet Union was quite strong there. It's something, from my point of view, it's something that is haunting us here in the Czech Republic or generally in Central Europe uh, now as well. The, uh, the idea that uh, we should we shouldn't be part of the uh, of the Western structures or the Western democracies, and we should play some interlocutor interlocutor role between uh, between Russia and, and the West. It was there after the Second World War, and sometimes there are the ideas that we should play this role now uh, again. I agree that the Czechs uh, 
was talking about this possibility of being a bridge. Um, however, the Russians or the Soviets at the time made it very clear that this would not be allowed. They would have to um, live with being in, in this Soviet sphere of influence. I stress that the Russian troops left the country, unlike in our neighboring countries. Um, they were not our, on our territory, but I did mention that uh, Soviet advisors, the Soviet influence was definitely there. And uh, although in Poland and Hungary, etc., Bulgaria, uh, you had political trials um, relatively soon after the war in Czechoslovakia, they came much later. However, when they came, they uh, were worse than in some other countries. More people were arrested, more people were executed. So even without the Soviet troops being present, the Czechoslovak Communist Party at that time was very loyal, very uh, subservient and servile um, and, and fulfilled the Soviet wishes in the 50s. 60s was different. 60s saw the first sign of some kind of relaxation. But the Czechoslovak 50s demonstrated that uh, we were simply a Soviet puppet. They did what the Moscow wanted them to do. And so we uh, contributed uh, to the fact that we uh, remained uh, in the sphere of influence and that we became, as Jan Kavan said, puppet uh, of Moscow. This is not only a result of the external pressure, uh, result of the Second World War, we contributed to that. What was the impetus to have these political trials? Was there a changing attitude amongst the Czech people? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think the main impetus was uh, Stalin's designs. The trials, like in, in some of our neighboring countries, uh, ensured that people who were not perceived by Stalin as totally loyal, partly because they fought against the Germans, against the Nazis in the West and not in the Soviet Union, or they fought even earlier in Spain, or they were of Jewish origin, and there was a certain amount of anti-Semitism there. Um, all these people had to be removed and replaced by absolutely, totally loyal uh, Communist Party leaders, loyal to, uh, to Stalin. That brings us toward 68, 69. What happened that caused the Soviets to send in the tanks? After 20 years of communism, the, the communists themselves realized that things are simply not working, that the economy is uh, lagging behind countries uh, in uh, Western Europe, and simply uh, that people do not support the idea, the ideology of communism as uh, they did, as they were enthusiastic in late 40s. And so in order to preserve communists to, to remain a ruling party, they initiated some reforms, uh, however, that the Soviet Union was not happy with. I think certain Soviet leaders perceived those reforms as a direct threat, as a danger, as a possibility to undermine the uh, Soviet control over Central Eastern Europe. Some of the Soviet leaders were talking about uh, Czechoslovak disease, which they believed could infect even communist parties in Poland and, uh, and East Germany. Um, East German leaders in particular were very afraid of the impossible infection from the reforms, which were called the Prague Spring reforms. Those reforms, uh, I agree with Pavel, uh, helped to ensure that the communist party uh, stayed in power, but they did introduce uh, uh, a certain amount of democracy, they introduced uh, complete freedom of press and freedom of speech, freedom of assembly and association, things which were uh, unheard of uh, in, the, in the previous years. And I actually was active in those, in those times and uh, in my opinion, those several months of the spring of 1968 uh, made some of us feel more free than we ever did before in our lives, or I would say even after. Had it been accepted at that point, it was inevitable that the Soviets would have this uh, countries like Czechoslovakia and Poland and Hungary 
as buffer states between Russia and Western Europe. I think after the invasion, some people realized that uh, the world is divided by the Iron Curtain and by the uh, workings of the Cold War into blocks, into spheres of influence. And we tried to um, change that. And it was a um, extremely difficult, if not impossible task. On the other hand, I would argue that during the spring of 1968, most of us did not believe that the Russians would invade, um, or at least hoped that they would not invade. The um, Czechoslovak Communist Party leaders stressed that the reforms are designed to bring more democracy, um, what Dubček called the human face of socialism. But at the same time, they wanted to reassure the Soviet Union that Czechoslovakia will not go neutral, that it will stay loyal to Warsaw Pact. Um, they believed that this was the lesson of 1956 of Hungary. They believed that the Russians invaded Hungary in 56 because Hungary demanded uh, to be neutral. And Dubček thought if he declares loyalty to the Warsaw Pact, that he could avoid uh, the same fate. Uh, many people truly believed that the change is possible, that uh, the reforming process is something that can be kept, something that is real and something that will be accepted by the Soviet Union. That's why, for example, uh, the Czechoslovak Communist Party reformers, they had uh, their, the support of the people. People did support them. And the paradox is that uh, they were communists who brought some changes uh, to, uh, to the political system, some hope that things might get better, that there will be more, uh, uh, that, the, that the society will be more free, that you would be allowed to speak freely, you would be allowed to listen to radio or uh, television other than the state owned by state. Uh, that you would be allowed to travel, uh, that uh, you might uh, invest uh, your money in more you know, everyday consumption. They never expected that the Soviet Union would invade Czechoslovakia or the Warsaw Pact uh, countries would invade Czechoslovakia. There was a generation um, change, uh, very much indeed. Um, my father's generation in the late 40s, early 50s believed in the Soviet Union some of them even believed in some kind of Czechoslovak form of communism. Um, then my father, for example, was sentenced to 25 years imprisonment. So when I was a student uh, activist, uh, I started on the premise that we have to create a society where these uh, judicial murders, as, as we call them, would not be possible. We started on the premise that we have to change even a communist-run society uh, in such a way that the 50s will not be uh, repeatable. So by um, 68 Prague Spring reforms came gradually, step by step. And my generation um, uh, supported the reform communists, Tupcek, etc. But at the same time, we said, we support you because you allow us to speak you allow us to organize, you allow us to express the opinions of our generation. However, we do not necessarily agree on the same methods, same way of achieving uh, what was then decided, described as socialist society. And when our generation will have the opportunity, we will define our own methods, our own ways, our own ideas, how such a society, free society can be can be achieved. So I would say, yes, uh, we supported the, the reform communist leaders, but with a certain degree of skepticism or certain degree of, of distance. And we prepare, we were preparing our own generation um, approach, which was then, of course, destroyed by the tanks. What was the immediate motivator for the tanks to come in? The immediate motivator was a failure um, of the Soviet leaders led by, by Mr. Brezhnev at the time to persuade or cajole um, pressure the Czechoslovak communist leaders to stop the reforms or at least put a major brakes 
on the freedom of press in particular. By that time, the communist reformist leaders were following the pressure of the society and were no longer the main decision makers. And the um, processes in the society were slightly outside their control. And the Russians decided that the reformist communist leaders will not uh, obey. And therefore, the only way would be to uh, send the tanks and uh, impose their own government. So what was the nature of that invasion? Uh, if the Russians in, expected the Czechs to, to be in the street rejoicing and welcoming them with flowers, they were deeply disappointed. In fact, there was a, um, a fairly unusual widespread unity in opposing the troops throughout, even uh, both among the people who supported the communist reformists leaders and those who were uh, very anti-communist. Uh, there was total unity in opposing the occupation. Some people were, were killed and the Russians then um, imposed uh, step by step major restrictions and forced the Czechoslovak government to give up one reform after another. After 69, take us through the period and through the 70s and the 80s leading up to the Velvet Revolution in 89. I was born in 1989, a few months before the Velvet Revolution. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just uh, can you the experience of my parents and my grandparents uh, and my family. And especially if I ask my father, he, he was a student during those times, uh, he would tell you probably that it, uh, there was very tense atmosphere in the society that was hunting almost everybody, not just the adults, but also the children. When he studied uh, at the high school, uh, he wasn't allowed, for example, uh, to participate uh, in some clubs or in some social activities because the communist regime somehow said that uh, my family uh, cannot be trusted because it's not uh, socialist enough, it's not communist enough. And so, uh, for example, he uh, was really afraid that uh, uh, he couldn't uh, continue his study at the university. I was um, kicked out of the university uh, as, a, as a student leader uh, and eventually forced even out of the country. So by uh, summer 1969, I was forced to emigrate to uh, uh, United Kingdom. And, and I was asked by the... Uh, nascent Czech uh, uh, opposition, uh, underground opposition, uh, which included many of my uh, political student friends from the 60s. And they asked for uh, printing machines, duplicators, for uh, literature, which was not allowed to be published uh, in, in Czechoslovakia, uh, books written by uh, Czech authors who were banned from uh, uh, publishing in, inside the country, but also literature, Western academic literature from uh, fields such as political science, um, psychology and sociology and many other fields which uh, uh, in Czechoslovakia was very restricted. So uh, over the 20 years I spent in England, I and my friends smuggled 22 tons of literature into the country, which was then distributed by the opposition among uh, like-minded people. On the other hand, uh, I was very much aware from information which I received virtually every week from the opposition, that the opposition itself uh, was fairly isolated. People were afraid uh, to join them. In fact, at, at the height, um, was just uh, had just uh, 1,000 signatories. So um, you had on one hand a great courage of people who opposed and uh, were arrested. Some of my friends spent up to nine years imprisonment. And on the other hand, you also had people who succumbed to the pressure, or at least if, if they didn't openly collaborate, they uh, tried to survive by conforming in day-to-day uh, in, in -day life. As we move through the 70s and 80s, something happened that led to a peaceful uprising in Czechoslovakia and resulted in a casting off of the old regime and the formation of a pluralistic government. But that wasn't 
just something that happened in the Czech Republic? Aren't there changes in the Soviet Union itself that enabled this? Yes, the um, Czechoslovak uh, government in uh, late 80s was actually afraid of uh, the reforms uh, initiated uh, by Soviet leader Mikhail uh, Gorbachev. So it was really reform within the Soviet Union that created a sense and understanding within Czechoslovakia, not necessarily the government itself, that uh, there were opportunities to reform this uh, Czech society and actually to make it more open and democratic. I, I agree with that uh, partially. Gorbachev um, definitely initiated um, or started reforms, and I very much agree that the Czechoslovak uh, communist uh, leaders were extremely afraid of it, much more than in some other countries. But uh, the Gorbachev reforms were very cautious. Um, he didn't want to change communism. He wanted to uh, democratize it, modernize it. Gorbachev was definitely responsible for repairing the soil uh, for the changes in Eastern Europe. But uh, again, he unleashed a process which he was not able to control and, and he was ousted and, and in fact, uh, presided over the end of Soviet Union, um, which uh, Mr. Putin called the greatest tragedy uh, of that part of the century. What happened in 1989 went far beyond any uh, Gorbachev plans of reform. It was no longer reform. It was uh, basically, a, I would say, a change, um, as, they, as the phrase goes, a velvet revolution. A revolution because it really was qualitatively different and velvet because it was bloodless. How did the uh, velvet revolution gain national support? I think after uh, 40 years of communism, people were simply resigned. That was the result of communism. Afraid uh, to do anything uh, that uh, they might be punished for. There was one uh, group of people who, uh, let's say, still had some illusions. And there were young people, uh, students, those who initiated uh, these uh, and stood uh, firmly um, for uh, for changes that were not afraid uh, to uh, go uh, to streets and to uh, to demonstrate against uh, the the regime was there a signal was there something coming from moscow that the tanks would not roll in yes mikhail gorbachev when he came to power he clearly said that uh, whatever happens in central europe the, the 1968 would not repeat would not be repeated that the soviet tanks uh, would not come again I agree with very much with Pavel. Uh, uh, the communist leaders no longer believed in uh, in communism. It was nothing about ideology. It was about keeping power, and uh, and nothing else. And they were afraid that um, when their power would be challenged, uh, Gorbachev will let them go. He will not not support them. And yeah, this reassured the people that this time, unlike in '68. Um, the tanks will not roll in. And the aftermath of that revolution, in a nutshell, formation of the Slovakia and the Czech Republic, how, how was the country made different because of the Velvet Revolution? Look, everything, everything changed. I mean, th this is, this is uh, one of those key dates uh, in, our, uh, in our history. We became a free and democratic uh, country. And I think if you look back, uh, all uh, social groups within our society, they benefited from the change. Not only politically in sense that we are more free, but definitely also more uh, also economically with, with the rise of living standards. Uh, in spite of all difficulties and even frustrations we have been through, uh, the, the, the 1989 was the key uh, term that finally brought us back to uh, on the path of uh, democracy. I want to go back to something that Jan Kavan said, where he mentioned that, according to uh, Putin, the breakup 
of the Soviet Union was the greatest disaster. He simply said it was the greatest tragedy uh, uh, of the 20th century. Thank you very much. Uh, you have someone indicating what happened in a country like the Czech Republic as a tragedy. That is certainly not the view in the Czech Republic. <laughs> I was born in 1989. I was born already to a democratic world. And for me, it's really hard to imagine the life before the revolution. Uh, if I'm thinking about uh, people who were not able to travel, uh, who were afraid to say anything uh, to their friends, it's, it's, really hard to, it's really hard to imagine. And uh, after the revolution, we were able to go everywhere, to fly everywhere. So uh, it is amazing. Thank you, Eva. Yeah, well, I, I can't agree more. When I was a schoolboy, it was absolutely normal for me to travel to Germany to meet uh, my relatives there, to, to go there for a holiday, to buy toys there, because, you know, the capitalism there was something very different. <laughs> and uh, I also can't imagine how it how it was before the Velvet Revolution, but my uh, my father told me that uh, he was caught off guard when the revolution came. And he didn't believe that it could it could really happen. And after the after the revolution, when there was a democracy, when there was a capitalism, he he told me that for a while he didn't know what to do. What will his future be? Because uh, during the uh, the communist regime times, he thought he had no future. And now there was a chance and what to do with it. Yeah, and it was it took him some time to, to realize the new reality. Well, and after that, you know, he started his business and he participated in politics and so on. At what point in, in the post uh, Velvet Revolution period does NATO enter the picture? On um, 12th of March, I, uh, as Czech foreign minister, uh, in Kansas City, uh, together with my uh, friend from the dissident, dissident times, a Polish dissident, uh, um, Bronik uh, Geremek, and a Hungarian foreign minister, Martoni, we signed the uh, accession papers with uh, US Secretary of State, uh, Morden Albright. So we um, ensured that our three countries uh, joined, uh, joined NATO. And what year was that? 1999. 1999. The fact that Czech Republic is a member of NATO. Has that worked out for the good or for less than good? It depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I think that <laughs> Mr. Putin wouldn't be very happy about that. <laughs> but, you know, uh, it was the first enlargement of NATO uh, that happened after, uh, after the end of the Cold War. So it started the process uh of admission of new countries from the central and and eastern europe and for example if we talk about the czech republic it uh started a process that led to our admission to to the european union and uh, to our admission to the let's say western european family of countries so it was it, it didn't have just the military dimension it had a very significant cultural and political political dimension and it is seen as um, a very important point in our history. And I think that many people appreciate that. Of course, there are some who do not. There are some people that uh, probably would prefer our foreign policy or our country to uh, get closer to Russia, but uh, the majority appreciate it, yeah. I would add, add one more information. There is, uh, statistically speaking, general consensus that we are benefiting uh, from uh, the membership in NATO. Personally, I am uh, glad that uh, that my country is a uh, um, member of, uh, of NATO. And uh, one of the reasons why there is Russian invasion to Ukraine and not to other countries is that uh, that we and other countries, Baltic countries, that we are in NATO. I, I agree with, with that point. Uh, I was talking about statistics in the early 90s. There was a great support among the Czechs for us 
uh, as the phrase went, to return to Europe, i.e. to join the European Union. There was less support for uh, joining NATO. It went from uh, 36% up to 56% in, in 1999. Um, but I agree that uh, by the time we joined, uh, a majority of country um, agreed with uh, um, our membership of NATO. So all this discussion is actually bringing to my mind one sentence of Václav Havel, who said that Russia has just one problem. And the problem is that Russia uh, doesn't know where it ends. And because of this, uh, I am actually really happy that we are in NATO, because if we are looking at the situation where we are right now in this time, I think that it's really important and we should be really happy. Eva, I love you. Thank you so much. <laughs> of course, uh, the NATO is a cornerstone of, of our defense and of our security. But uh, I think that even for my generation, the young generation that was born into democracy and into capitalism, uh, the presence of the NATO and its existence has become very significant in recent days because uh, as far as I know, for many young people, it was a shock when they saw uh what was happening in ukraine because they couldn't imagine that something like that could happen in europe or in their lifetime because you know we've been talking about just, just a history just a memory of their parents or grandparents but now many were really surprised that it can happen in the lifetime of our generation that was used to live in a world that is free democratic and so on so on so even these people who didn't realize the existence of NATO or the impact it it had on our security now, they, from my point of view, they understand. As uh, Jan Železny said, uh, the impact of membership in NATO, and let's say, let's put it more broadly, NATO and uh, the European Union. It's not only that we get some uh, uh, military uh, guarantees uh, uh, that nobody would attack us. It's uh, it's actually what uh, Jan Kavan pointed to. Uh, the the membership in these two institutions. It it's some uh, ways. It's a symbol that we are back in a family uh, of countries, uh, democratic countries, European countries uh, with pro-Atlantic uh, uh, orientation. Therefore, I would uh, never want uh, to uh, change uh, that direction. I agree with, with the others that because our membership of NATO, um, we uh, have a full right to enjoy much greater security. For me, it's absolutely clear that um, even uh, aggressive Russia will never attack uh, a territory of a, a NATO member country. Um, despite all the uh, rhetoric in some media. Having said that, I have to admit that I'm much happier to be um, in the European Union uh, than in NATO. Um, I, I do have uh, certain criticism of some NATO's policies. Uh, when I was president of the United Nations General Assembly in March 2003, although it was not strictly NATO, invasion. Um, uh, it was US-led invasion into Iraq, which I uh, deeply opposed at the UN at the time, and I'm very critical of it till today. Um, equally, I disagreed with the NATO bombing of uh, former Yugoslavia and the um, separation of Kosovo from, from Serbia uh, later. On the other hand, as I said, my criticism does not contradict the fact that I, uh, as a Czech citizen, feel secure in the fact that Czech Republic is a member of NATO. Thank you very much. Uh, this uh, brings to a conclusion episode one of our Citizen Arts podcast, talking about Czech Republic, Central and Eastern Europe, Ukraine, and Russia. I think something is very clear from the points made by, very astutely made by our panel, that there are parallels to um, in Czech history vis-a-vis -vis Russia 
to what's going on now between, between Ukraine and Russia, and particularly prior to the invasion. Some of what you have talked about, um, certain movements within Ukraine toward a more Western orientation, a continuing Western orientation, uh, growing uh, paranoia, fears, whatever you want to call it in Russia about that, and, uh, and, and other uh, aspects, cultural, uh, social, economic, that can be drawn. It's not this, exactly the same situation, but there are certainly very distinct and important uh, aspects to it. Some of those we are going to get into in some depth in episode two, where we are going to discuss Ukraine, your views, what it might mean to the Czech Republic, to people of the Czech Republic, and maybe to Central Europe and Eastern Europe overall. So all of that is to come. So please join us for episode two, and we will have our panel back. Thank you very much. Stay safe and healthy.